Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Cool family, I want to thank you so much for being here. I also want to thank you for all your prayers, for all the practical ways you've uh, comforted and blessed the family the past few days. As you know, we're here to celebrate Jim's life. And in a few minutes, we will have time in the service for anyone who would like to say a few words about Jim, uh, a memory or a, a remembrance, because there's something that happens at a gathering like this among people who knew and loved Jim. And, and when people start talking about his life, when they start bringing up good memories, you know, it creates this beautiful sense of God's presence and God's comfort. Uh, so, so you don't have to. Don't feel bad if you, if you don't uh, say a few words or you feel like you can't. But some of you may want to talk briefly about something you remember about Jim, uh, a short story that exemplifies who he was. And I'm telling you now so you can kind of start thinking about what you might say. Uh, obviously, we won't have time for everyone to do that, but uh, hopefully several will, will want to do that. Before we do that, though, I, could I just say two quick things about the service today? One is about grief, and one is about God. The, the first is about grief. It, uh, it's okay to grieve. The, the Bible says Jesus wept. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. If you ever have to be in a Bible memory contest. Make sure that's the, the verse that you memorize. Jesus wept. And so if Jesus, you know, could grieve, then, then, then so can we. It's actually God's way of helping us work through and, and process our love and our loss of someone special. And I'll just say this, that everybody grieves differently. Some people are very emotional and you know, maybe they get all their grief out of the way all at once. Other people take a long time to grieve. Some people in their grief feel angry or disappointed with God or even the person who passed. Some don't feel anything at all. They just, you know, I'm numb. What is wrong with me? But that's okay. Grief is pretty unpredictable. But at the same time, it's there to help us to get through really difficult times in life. The second thing I'll talk about is about God because at a service like this, it's natural to think about God. You know, our lives uh, are so fast-paced that it seems like uh, there, there's only a few times when we actually slow down enough to think about uh, spiritual things. And at a service like this, I, I think it's natural to think about things like what happens when we die? And, and, and where, do, where do we go? Is, is, is this it or is there an afterlife? Is heaven real? What about hell? Can you trust what the Bible says about all those things? What about Jesus? These are questions I think all of us ask as we go through life, but at a service like this, it's almost like the volume gets turned up on all those questions. I think it's natural. In fact, I, I think it's God speaking to our hearts and it can kind of cut through the trivial stuff of life with a clarity that could scare you. But my advice is this, don't, don't be scared, don't tune it out. I think it's God's still small voice. He's, he's working in you, he's speaking to you and it's important to listen to the Lord because you won't always be able to hear him as clearly as you will hear him today. So pay close attention. He loves you. He wants the best for you and he's here, amen? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask you to speak to us now as we enter into your presence in this place. Thank you so much for this good man's life, Jim Cool. Thank you that you're the God that he believed in, that you're the God that he served, and that you're the God he's with right now. We look to you, O oh Lord, the God of all comfort and hope, and we pray this now in Jesus' name, amen.
I believe my steps are growing wearier each day. Still, I've got a journey on my mind. Lures of this old world have ceased to make me want to stay. And my one regret is leaving you behind. But if it proves to be his will that I am first to cross, and somehow I've a feeling it will be. When it comes your time to travel, likewise don't feel lost, for I will be first one that you see. I'll be waiting on the far side banks of Jordan. I'll be waiting, drawing pictures in the sand. And when I see you coming, I'll rise up with a shout and come running through the shallow waters, reaching for your hand. Through this life we've labored hard to earn our meager fare. It's brought us trembling eyes and failing eyes. I'll just rest here on this shore and turn my eyes away. Until you come then we'll see paradise. And I'll be waiting on the far side banks of Jordan. I'll be sitting drawing pictures in the sand. And when I see you coming, I'll rise up with a shout and come running through the shallow waters reaching for your hand. There are loved ones in the glory whose dear forms you often miss. When you close your earthly story, will you join them in their bliss? Will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by, there's a better home awaiting in the sky lord in the sky and i'll be waiting on the far side banks of jordan i'll be sitting drawing pictures in the sand and when i see you coming i'll rise up with a shout and come running through the shallow waters reaching for your hand and come running through the shallow waters reaching for your hand Why don't we uh, stand and we're going to sing a hymn together. I see 
the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout The universe display Then sings my soul my Savior God to Thee How great Thou art How great Thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to How great Thou art, how great Thou art, and when I think that God, His Son, not sparing in Him to die. I scarce can take it in That on the cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my My soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. How great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior. Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, when Christ shall come with shout of shall bow with humble adoration and then proclaim how great thou art then sings my soul my soul God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, then sings my soul, my soul.
Amen. You can be seated. Well, how can you sum up in a, just a few words what somebody's life meant? It doesn't seem fair to have to think of one memory or uh, uh, about a person's life who has meant so much and think that somehow that's going to adequately define who they were. But it is important as Jim's friends and family to encourage each other with those memories and those remembrances. So if you'd like to say something uh, about his personality, a story you remember, I'm gonna ask you to stand up right where you are. We'll have a mic for you. We'll, we'll hand you a mic uh, and speak loudly and briefly. <laughs> loudly and briefly. And uh, to, to start things off, uh, Jack Williams is going, to, uh, is going to come, and this is a close, close friend of Jim and uh, Donetta's. Uh, yeah, you can, sure, you can come, please. that I would get through this, that I, wouldn't, that I would try not to cry. As a matter of fact, I went to the doctor and I said, uh, can we tie my tear ducts closed for a week? And he said, uh, that's not the greatest thing I've ever heard. And I said, well, how about some super glue? Would that work? So you can see I've got a little bit of a, I got a little bit of a, a stringing sense of humor. I, uh, I call it a blessing, you might call it a curse. Um, first of all, may, I, may I, you join me in prayer? Uh, please touch all that are mourning Jim's passing. Lord, we do not know what the future holds, but we do know that you hold the future. We know that you hold us in our, and our loved ones in your hands and that you are our shelter and our refuge in times of grief. Please give us the courage and strength to laugh and to celebrate Jim's life. Help us determine that you are in control, you hear our prayers, and that you will heal our hearts and that you are faithful. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we ask all these things. If you don't mind, I'm going to read because I want to get through it, and I want, I want, uh, there's words in here that are very, very important uh, to me, very important to share. Um, I'm not that great of a speaker. As a matter of fact, I dropped uh, speech class in college, and that was what my, what my uh, number one talent was in college. I knew that drop ad date, and before I was going to flunk it, I was going to drop it. I don't know why they always said it was a drop ad. I never saw the reason to add any course. So I dropped it, and um, my speech my speech professor is probably pretty happy with me that I, that I chose to do that. So I am going to read. I've got a short note from a good friend of his that couldn't be here today. His name is Dave Page. He shares a birthday with me. He uh, spent many years at the Jersey Shore uh, with the Kules, and here's his, his note that he wanted to share. I miss Jim. We have been friends for many years. It began, began as we attended a monthly small group program sponsored by our West Lawn Church, Jim led the group discussions. One time we disagreed with each other and we both stood up to do a close face-to-face -face resolution of the discussion. Jim was tall, all I could see was his neck and all, I could see was, and all he could see was my shiny bald head. This wasn't going to work so we both sat down laughing. We, when we were together, Jim and I enjoyed our mission work together in this country and out of the country on foreign soil, rehabbing homes and facilities. I will miss Jim's companionship on our annual trips to the New Jersey Shore. Next one is just two weeks from now. He will be remembered. Jim, hopefully I will see you again in the big house, in the sky. I'll probably only have a small ramshackle of a place on a dark cloud is deserved, but I will find you. Love you, buddy. Your friend, Dave. When thinking what I was going to say today, 
I, I have to name it. I've got to come up with a name. I've got to have a reference, and whether it's on the computer or what, I've just got to be able to call it something. I was going to call it, well, good, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, that's been used a hundred times, so I scratched that one off. I thought, how about, what does a life's impact look like? Well, that's also very good and very encouraging and description and very descriptive of the impact of Jim Kuehl, but might make, me, might make me look like a great philosopher, which you, you've already figured out I am not. How about popcorn in Old Bay? How about, pop, how about Old Bay on popcorn? He liked all that, right? Okay. Uh, no, that's a little too simple. So what, I did, what did I say to Lon? Well played, my friend. Well played. Jimmy, that's what I called him. His response would be Mr. Jack. No one calls me Mr. Jack. I'm not that great of a, you know, authority figure. I don't think there's kids are running out of the playground saying, hey, Mr. Jack, Mr. Williams, no. But he would call me Mr. Jack. I think these were terms of endearment between friends. Um, he used to call my wife young lady. Every time you'd see her for the first time, he'd say, young lady. These were, these were, this was Jim connecting, right? Finding out, like you were the only person in the room. You were the only person in the world that he cared about at that time. That, that was his method, that was his package, right? And uh, I would respond, I called him Jimmy because I wanted to be foolish and I wanted to be childish. And I wanted to say, hey, we're just like two kids playing on a playground, becoming friends, getting out of the acquaintance stage. And you know what? We really loved each other. And, uh, and, and I'm so proud to say that as an adult male, it took me 55 years to be able to tell another adult male that was not in my family that I loved them. Jim was the first one. Uh, problem is, how do I condense Jim's life and what he meant to us, my wife and Karen, in a few minutes in the service? The stories, the mannerisms, the package that God created that was James Joseph Kuehl in society today, how are men measured? What are the adjectives we use? Is it by their physical nature, big, tall, masculine, strong, fierce, brave? You know the adjectives, you know the root, you, you know where I'm going with that. Or is it their collective adult resume? How about success in business or their chosen profession? Is it by the material possessions that collected throughout their lifetime? Well, Jim, here's how I describe you. Sure, you were a tall and imposing figure. Yes, you were successful in your chosen field. And yes, you had a beautiful home. But I think we can all agree that the adjectives we would use to describe Jim would be very different. Caring, compassionate, faithful, friendly, loving, honest. I, I'm not that great of a golfer, okay? But I have played golf with him, right? So we were playing golf back in Reading and at a country club, and, after, and I was his partner, and he was trying to score, and he was trying to get his quarters, and I was, I was defeating every single time that he tried to get something. We walked off the course, put his hand on my shoulder, said, Mr. Jack, have you ever thought of taking up tennis? He could, be, he could be honest. But the one word, the word, the most powerful word, the commandment that Jim followed more than anything else is love. He loved God and all the teachings. It gave Jim's life a firm foundation. It about life struggles and but what, and here is the big but, the struggles, problems, and fears that we all have, Jim would turn around to hopes and blessings. Blessings. That simple word has given me so much comfort since last Thursday. I imagine what Jim would say to me if he knew that I was mourning the loss of a great friend. He would turn the conversation to the positive. Focus on a blessing, Jack. Focus on the relation that, relationship that I provided in your life. Think about your life and what it would be like if God did not have those, put that person in your life, those memories, those shared experiences of your close friend. You see, in a very special way, Jim's really writing this. I'm just the voice. Jim loved his family very much. I mean, Donetta, the boys, of course, the grandchildren, the families, the extended families, the friends. Man, he was good at making friends, right? I was so envious of his ability to make friends. <sighs> he was excellent, excellent. Many years ago, this is how it started, and I'm, and I'm making this brief. Many years ago, I responded on a Sunday the, the, on the, at the church we, were, we both attended. They said that uh, a, uh, an elderly woman needed help moving out of a, an apartment into an assisted living. 
So anybody can help show up at one o'clock and we'll gather up and we'll get their, get her moved. So we show up and the organizer said, okay, those with trucks, which I was one, grab somebody who doesn't have a truck, Jim was one, and let's go. In the truck, in comes James Joseph Kuehl, right? And uh, here's where God and our paths cross, right? That was, I had no way of knowing, wasn't, I was just there to simply move a couch or two and, and get home. I didn't know it that, that day, it was earth shattering. By the way, Jim did not bang his head on anything that day. He, he, if you know Jim, there was a lot of scars up here on that big forehead is. He did not. Uh, Jim loved to be the hands and feet of God. He, gave, he wanted to give back, to share. He used to say to me that his skill set was limited, that he was just trying to do something positive in this world to make the world a little bit better place than he found it. He volunteered, he went on mission trips, he helped us in our church very extensive kitchen ministry, he gave back. As a matter of fact, on one of those visits to the Virginia Beach, in one of our visits, he said, hey, Jack, Saturday morning, where you want to go help us? And we're at a uh, serve breakfast at a homeless shelter in downtown Virginia Beach. And I said, sure. I said, yeah, let's, let's do it. So off we go, 7 o'clock in the morning, and we go to a homeless shelter to serve breakfast. First thing Jim does when he gets there, he picks up a mop and, and fills up the, the bucket, and he's, and he's mopping the floor, and he's mopping the, the, the common area. And I said, that's kind of weird. Wouldn't we wait till like after we serve breakfast? He goes, Jack, the people that are coming here to be served, they deserve a nice, clean place. It's the, it's the least we can do. And I'm like, Psh. so, right, he'd be right. Uh, by the way, on that, on that trip that morning, right, after he ran the second red light, I said, Jim, I said, Jim, are, are red lights here in Virginia, are they just a suggestion or is that a law? And he goes, oh, you noticed that. <laughs> on a mission trip to, uh, to Mississippi, uh, Katrina Recovery, uh, our church took a bus trip of 60 people, and Jim was one of them. And, uh, it, and my job at that time was to, was to organize. I was the leader of that trip, so I had to keep all 60 people uh, busy and safe. And I was doing a terrible job. And people would call and say, what's my next job? Where's that tool? How do I do this? Where do I go next, right? And then I got one phone call and it said, hey, can you help me? I need a favor. And I said, what's that? And said, they said, well, I'm up on the third story of the roof, you know, two blocks down and uh, repairing some roof damage, but somebody took all the ladders. <laughs> and Jim said, I got it. Jim jumps in the car, drives to Home Depot, buys three ladders with his own money, brings them back, sets them up. That's who Jim was. He was listening, he cared, and he responded. The constant here in Jim's life was love. Love of God, family, friends, giving back. He was the entire package. He became a role model of sorts to, for me to how to live in this very complicated world and how to fa fa uh, focus on, on what matters most. In closing, one of my favorite Jim Kuehl stories. This, of all the stories, and I met the, I met the Le Lebanon Connection last, and I heard some of their stories, right? And, and we can, we'll share these stories, I'm sure, sometime today, but this is my favorite one, my favorite one. We're down here, this happened in Virginia Beach, and we come down, and Jim tells, and Jim and Danette tell us about the great golf club caper. And I said, oh, what, what happened? He said, well, he said, uh, I went out to go play my next round of golf at his, this is when the golf course was still open at their home course, and I went out to the truck to get my golf clubs, gone. He said, I pulled back the tonneau cover for you truck novices. That's the thing that, that keeps the truck bed uh, safe. He said, and the golf clubs were gone. And, and he went in and reported to Netta, stolen. I, can't, I didn't have it locked. They're gone. What, well, you know what? Off to the golf club store they go, right? I don't know what, did you report it to the police? So off to, off to the golf course, uh, the uh, golf equipment store they go, right? And then when you know, you golfers out there, right? It's not just the clubs. It's the golf bag and all the accessories, everything that you thought you had in that bag, you, you, and you get your whole new package. And, you know, you gotta, you know he, he's down here to play golf. It's, it's biggest, one of his biggest hobbies. 
And he gets his all new package, gets it all set up, goes back to the golf course the next time to play his next round of golf, gets out of his truck. Here comes the young, young golf course attendant saying, Mr. Kuehl, good morning. Hey, by the way, the golf clubs that you left here last, last time are sitting over there. Do you want me to throw them in your truck? When I heard this, I'm like, well played, dude. That is such a great story. How you executed that with beyond belief. And I'm like, I'm getting chills right now just repeating the story. And I'm like, I got to remember the story. I got to, re and, then I, and on, the, on our way home, now we've got about a six hour drive back to Reading, PA. And as you know, and I'm sure you can, you can relate, your mind starts to wonder, right? And I'm like, how can I replicate this? How can I use this to my benefit? And I'm like, well, I don't play golf, so I can't lose my golf clubs. Okay, well, Jack, go down your list. Well, what do you like? Well, I like sports cars. <laughs> and I have a Corvette. But I can always use an upgrade. So Karen, we left the garage door open. It's gone. I guess we'll have to just go get another one. Great, great story. But when I think about that, that's where I started with, man, what a, what a life well played. He had a plan. You know when you're golf, you know, and it's that, that hole, the, that, that approach shot, oh, well played. Well played, partner, right? Or the hole was well played. You set it up and you came at the right angle. Well, well played. Or the whole 18 holes, like you know, you had a plan. You were, you were, you know, you weren't driving the ball well, so you went back to your irons and you, you left your driver in the back. Well played, dude, right? Well, that's Jim's life. Well played. He had a plan. He had a plan to create a family. He had a plan to be. God's hands and feet in this world. Amen. He had a plan to be impactful, but he didn't ever try to be impactful. Hmm. That was the, he taught me so many things, but he, but he knew I'm just a bullheaded coal miner from Pennsylvania. You try to teach me something, I'm gonna go the opposite way. So he said, you know what? I'll just show Jack by example. Thank you very much for sharing. I know it was a little long, but those are the words from my heart. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Well, <laughs> thanks, uh, Mr. Jack. I appreciate that. I think uh, your speech professor would be proud, and more importantly, uh, Jim would be proud also. So, uh, somebody else here, we have a microphone for you. So my apologies, Reverend Brooks. This is not going to be a few words, and it may not be brief. Jim was my brother. Technically, he was my half-brother. And we were both lucky to have been raised by the same mother, albeit 21 years apart. We weren't siblings in the traditional sense, since Jim was already out of the house, mostly through his, uh, through, through his studies at Purdue, and dating Danetta, who would be his wife for more than 51 years. We didn't have those special sibling moments or sibling rivalries that many of you have probably experienced personally or at least seen on TV. But we were connected in a very real sense. And I have had some time over this past week to reflect on this sort of strange but great relationship that we've had over these past 50 years. What only a few of you know is that Jim was also one of my godfathers. And maybe this was a more apt description of our relationship. For many people, hearing the word godfather brings up the images of Italian mob bosses calling in hits on rival families. But my view of a godfather is one who's both a spiritual guide and a mentor. And just maybe I didn't realize the impact Jim had on me growing up until I had some time to really think about it. Looking back, Jim's integrity, faith, and service to others are the three characteristics that are at the top of mind when I think about him. Integrity is standing up for what you believe is right and living by your highest values. No matter where you are, who you're with, or what you are doing, you will act in a way that you believe is the best way to act. It is being honest and sincere with others and with yourself. Jim once told me the story about the day he told my father, or his stepfather, uh, 
that he and Donetta were going to be married. But it was going to be in Donetta's church, and this was not a Catholic church. I can only imagine the 40 shades of red and purple my devoutly Catholic father's face must have turned when he digested the news of this marriage of mixed religions. Despite pleas to change venues, the potential threat of boycott, Jim stood his ground and the marriage proceeded successfully for more than 50 years. Dad and Jim grew to respect each other and love each other with a bond that I believe was forged partially by this experience. As many of you know, Jim liked to challenge your beliefs at the dinner table, at a bar, or on a walk. Sometimes I wondered if the debate was more about Jim just being contrary than anything else. But on balance, I think the discourse was more about Jim gauging other people's integrity and his genuous, genuine openness to learning and something that this world seems to be sorely lacking today. Another characteristic I admired about Jim was his Christian faith. I myself am a non-practicing Catholic who admittedly lacks faith. So maybe it's ironic that I really admire it in others. Jim lived his life on a spiritual journey. Clearly Jim did not find the spirituality he was looking for in the Catholic Church, but he was undeterred in his spiritual journey. As the obituary mentioned, Jim and Donetta moved several times throughout their lives. In each new place, they sought a church where they found grace through Jesus' teachings and others who shared their same strong sense of Christian community. However, like the rest of us, Jim could get frustrated, angry, impatient, and sometimes moody. Often when Jim visited or when we were on vacation together, he would be up early, maybe after a run, maybe after a walk, and you would find him in a quiet place, a comfortable chair in the den, a rocker on the balcony overlooking the water, seeking answers and enlightenment through reading scriptures, passages, or short sermons on his tablet or his well-worn books. Jim did not brag about his faith nor flaunt what he was doing. In my view, he looked like he was finding peace and centering himself for the challenges of a new day. And if I'm being honest, I might just be a little bit jealous. Of all the accomplishments Jim had in his life, I most admired his service to others. Both alone and with the boys, Jim participated in annual Christian mission service trips. It brought real help to people who were often in desperate circumstances. But Jim's service work was not limited to once a year trips. He was very active in his own communities, driving people to appointments, Finding food, for their pant finding food for pantries, staying with people and helping to fix their homes, even inviting people in need to his own home for family meals and countless other acts of Christian service. Jim's service and mentorship, both large and small, was a testament to the impact he had on so many lives. In a world where so much social interaction occurs virtually, Jim set out to purposefully interact with the community and make it better. I'd like to conclude with this story, which immediately came to mind when I sat down to write this. As a child in the mid-1970s, I was not what you would call well-traveled. I think most of my time was spent within a 10-mile radius of my home in Cincinnati, with the occasional weekend trip to Columbus, and an annual summer trip to Dubuque, Iowa. One of the places that Jim and Donetta moved to early in their life together was Blytheville, Arkansas. As a kid, I was kind of excited about the prospect of going to such an exotic location. In my kid brain, any place that, never really, that I never really heard of was exotic, and the only, place, uh, the only thing I knew about Arkansas was vaguely where it was on a map of a 50-piece puzzle that I had of the United States. As, <clears throat> as an adult, the true origin of the word found that my suspicions about the word blithe were genuinely true. Blithe means cheerful, joyous, and pleasant. I'm not sure when we made the trip in 1970-something, but I'm sure it was the summer because it was hot. 
the hottest place I had ever been in my short life. And the town was surrounded by blooming cotton fields and not much else. This town did not live up to its dubious billing. One evening, evidently when the blacktop had cooled enough not to melt our sneakers to the pavement, Jim took Sean and I to a local school where they had a basketball hoop. I'm not sure if Sean remembers this. Despite all the running, working out, and golfing that Jim did in his life, I think his true passion was playing basketball. I can still see him do a quick dribble, square up to the hoop with one foot turned slightly inward, the other pointed at the basket, the look of concentration on his face as he sucked in his lower lip, jumped, released the ball towards the hoop, and it was effortless, and it was amazing. Meanwhile, Sean and I would scramble around with whatever worn out, faded orange, dingy black ball that had been replaced some time before. We would flail around, sort of dribble with one or both hands and fling the ball up towards the hoop, underhand, overhand, by any means necessary. Only very occasionally brushing the bottom of the net, possibly even the underside of the rim. Usually it was nothing but air. The hoop, of course, was not the kind you see in yards today. It did not have a glass backboard. It was metal. It did not have a hand crank which could adjust to anything below 10 feet. It was solid and it was sturdy. And for a couple of kids under eight years old, it was formidable. Jim would let us try and try. He would offer encouragement. He would let us do it ourselves until he could sense we were getting frustrated. Only after we reached the point where we were about to quit and find something else to do, did he intervene. He handed us the ball, reached under our shoulders, lifted us up over his head to the rim and let us throw the ball into the hoop. What a feeling. With this newly found confidence, one of us, it was probably Sean, managed to heave one up into the basket and it felt like the greatest accomplishment ever. Throughout my life, I've seen the same scenario play out in different ways with both kids and adults. People are faced with a problem. Jim might let them struggle some, figure it out for themselves, offer encouragement, offer suggestions, and maybe even let them fail. But in the end, Jim would see people in need, love them for who they are, lift people up, and give them the confidence to get better. That's the Jim I'm gonna remember and continue to celebrate. Thank you. Amen, amen, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, um, is there anybody else who would like to say just a brief word? Jerry, if you just stand loudly and briefly. Okay. I'm Jerry Perkins, and my, my wife and I moved here about seven years ago. You know nobody we live in the same subdivision as Jim and Danelle, and first time he made the initiative to come to me and say, I will introduce you to a monthly dinner group, which has a lot of people there. That set the foundation for a social. The pool, he introduces to the pool, more people there were golfers, played many a wonderful round with Jim. They had just a wonderful time. And I said, he said, you play with any group? No. Nope. He said, show up Saturday morning and I'll introduce you to a good group. And he did. And those are still friends of mine to today. Jim was a good golfer. Hmm. And the big thing was, seven years ago, he said, you go to church? And I said, yeah. Do you have a church? No. You're Christian? Yeah. And I said, I looked at a half a dozen different churches and I just hadn't found the one I want. I'm looking for a casual temporary church. Jim got the biggest smile on his face and says, have I got a church for you? <laughs> <laughs> and I've been a member here for seven years and just had a wonderful Christian life here. Thank you, Jim and Danielle. And God is saying to Jim, you have touched so many people here on this earth that your rewards in heaven are going to be great. Amen. Thank you, Jim, for all of that. Amen. Very good. Very good. Is 
Anybody else? Going once. Well, when I... um, When I was thinking about this service, I just thought about the grace that not only Jim carries himself with, but that he exemplifies in his service. I think you've mentioned it. Of course, I think Jack did too. And so we're gonna, we're gonna sing as a congregation, Amazing Grace, Dusty's gonna lead us. So let's, let's stand together and sing this song together. Twenty-third Psalm, obviously one of the most read and beloved scriptures in the whole Bible. Would you, would you um, re- repeat that verse with me? You have it on this for the screen. Yeah, let's say it together. The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He light, leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Within these six brief verses, 
lie three, what I, I think are very powerful phrases that remind me of why we're gathered here today. The first, right in the middle of this passage, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And one thing Jim's death shows us is that you, you never know. I'm sure you were just as shocked as, as I was to hear that Jim had passed. And I, I mean, we, we all know that we're going to die someday, but of course we don't, we don't dwell on it. Uh, in fact, I think we naturally avoid thinking about dying, but when you think about how sudden Jim's death was, the question really is, how important is it to be ready? Because we don't know. I was thinking this, this week what it means to be ready uh, to, to, to face death. And I thought about a flight uh, on an airplane I was on a while back and, and it, something went wrong uh, with the plane. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been on a plane when something like that happens, but I have a fear of heights, first of all. And then I also get panicky uh, on um, on flights and and this this was a bad one and uh, if you've ever been in a situation like that um, where where you think you're not going to make it I don't want to be too dramatic but when, if you've ever been in a situation like that you start to think about two things you think about God and you think about your loved ones you you ultimately think am I right with God because I'm I may have to meet him very soon. And secondly, am I right with the people around me? And thankfully, you know, Jim was right with, with both. And I think if he could be here with us today, he'd say, look, whatever you do, make sure before this day's over, you're right with God and you're right with the people around you. Don't wait because you never know. Amen. The second uh, powerful phrase in the 23rd Psalm that I want to point out is this one. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And, and of course, King David here is talking about heaven, uh, the house of the Lord forever. And doesn't he have confidence, King David, that he's, gonna, he's headed there when he dies? He says, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Not I might or I hope to or... I, I wish I would. You know, he's got this assurance. And um, again, it makes me think, you know, do, do you know for sure you'll go to heaven when you die? Because all of us will spend eternity somewhere. But not everybody goes to heaven and not everybody has the, this assurance that David had uh, that he would wind up in heaven. When I talk to people sometimes and the, the topic of death or maybe heaven comes up and I'll say, well, you know, what do you think? Are you going to heaven when you die? And the usual answers I get are, well, I'm crossing my fingers. Uh, I'm 90% sure, or I hope so. But folks, God wants it to be a no-so situation with you. And I'll be honest with you, if anybody deserved to go to heaven, it was Jim. One of the things Donetta said to me on the day that Jim died was that the, the week before he passed, she hadn't heard him in the house for a while and she wondered where he was, what was going on. So she went to check and she finally found him in the, in the guest room on his knees praying there. And she said that was not unusual for him. He was a man of prayer. Um, the life group that Jim is in here at, at Coastal, uh, the, the life group leader told me the, the day before Jim died, Wednesday morning at their life group, that Jim closed the group in prayer. He, he, was, a, he was a man of prayer. And he put feet to his prayers. He volunteered here at our food pantry, at, at the hospital, I mean, you name it. When the, the, the phrase that comes to my mind when I think of Jim is that he loved God and he loved people. 
And if I think about it with my head, I think if anybody could earn their way to heaven by being good enough, it was Jim. But the truth of the matter is that nobody can be good enough to get to heaven. Nobody. Even Jim needed Jesus to be a Christian, to get to heaven, to have the assurance that that's where he would wind up one day. And that's true for all of us as well. So I wonder, do you have that assurance of heaven? Not, not based on how good you are, how faithful, but instead based on the fact that you said yes to Jesus' offer of salvation. Well, the last phrase uh, is actually the first phrase in the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And the word Lord, is a, is a, it's a Bible word that just means the boss, the person who's in charge, the one I give my life to in this case. And again, David, King David, who wrote the 23rd Psalm, he speaks with this confidence when he says, the Lord is my shepherd. He made it personal. Can you say the Lord is really your shepherd? How do you do that? Well, Jesus made it clear in one of the most familiar verses in the Bible, John 3, 16. Here's what Jesus said. For God so loved the world, the world being you and I, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, of course, who was Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins as our substitute, that whoever believed in him and, and believing in Jesus means giving your life to him because he died for you. Whoever believes in him should not perish, meaning being separated for, from God forever, but have everlasting life, which means to be with God in heaven. Each one of us will face death one day so why not make sure you're ready to face eternity now? You know, why wait? Why put it off? Why not pray even today and put your life in the hands of a God who loves you and can save you? There are two types of funerals, in my estimation, those with hope and those without hope. This is a funeral, thank the Lord, with hope because we know where Jim is. But the question is, what kind of funeral service will, will you have when everyone gathers for, for your service? Will they be celebrating your home going, knowing where you're going because you lived your life for the Lord? Or will they be scratching their heads, wondering inside where you're spending eternity because there's no evidence to suggest you are a Christ follower? And, and wouldn't it be an honor to Jim's memory if you were just to settle all that here and now and you can say, you know, it was at Jim's funeral that I gave my heart and my life to the Lord. Well, this, this past Sunday, I was very surprised to look out and see uh, Donetta. And I said to her, just that, I'm surprised to see you here today. You know what she said to me? She said, where else would I be? And then our praise team sang a song for the first time that morning called Surrounded by Holy. It's all about heaven. And after church, she came up to me with tears and she said, could we, just, could we play that song at Jim's funeral? Because that's what Jim's experiencing right now. And, she, and she's right, because the moment we realized Jim had, had passed so suddenly, we said, he's gone. But at that same moment in heaven, the Lord said, he's here. He's home. Watch this. Saints and angels bow. 
Stand for a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we know where Jim is today. What a, what a blessing. Lord, it, it was, it, it, it's hard to say goodbye so suddenly to somebody you loved and somebody who meant so much, but we're grateful that he's, he's in your care now. So Lord, the best we know how, we, we commit this good man, this husband, father, grandfather, friend, we commit his soul into your care. And Lord, we commit his, his memory into our hearts and pray that as the days go on, that those memories just would get sweeter and sweeter. And then finally, Lord, we, we commit ourselves into your loving hands and ask you as the God of all comfort, the God of hope, to be there when it's the hardest, uh, the darkest, when maybe nobody else knows. And may we be there for each other to encourage, strengthen, cheer one another on. Thank you so much, Lord, uh, for your son Jesus, who made all of this possible. We praise you. In your son Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, again, on, on behalf of the family, I want to thank you so much for being here and invite you to the Town uh, Center City Club. The directions are in the program. And uh, so hopefully you'll be able to go and join the family there again. Thanks for being here and God bless you.